Hello, everyone. Art and rock and roll. Name a more iconic pairing. In October of 2021, America House opened a new exhibit in our space in Kiev. Mark Arminsky Selected Works. Mark Arminsky is a Detroit-based fine art and print artist, and it's our great honor to be able to present his original silkscreen prints here in Kiev. While Kiev is in the red zone, we unfortunately are not accepting visitors to our exhibit space, but very soon we'll be back. And today we are talking with Mark himself and his friend, Steve Walters from Chicago, Illinois. They're both masters of the rock poster genre and have a wealth of background in, in the art scene in both cities. So please welcome Steve and Mark. Hi, how are you guys today? Hello. Very good. Good, yep. It's yep. so great that we're able to bring you both, you know, live from Chicago and Detroit tonight. And for everyone watching, we'll be taking your questions throughout the even evening. And we'll be talking all things independent art and how, you know, the independent music art scene also comes into that. So my first question is, Mark and Steve, how did you two meet? Because you've been not only colleagues, but friends for a long time. You, you know, to be honest with you, I don't remember how I met Steve. Or, or where. <laughs> I, I was just I, I know the same Steve thing. For, yeah. for how, how many years? 20 years now. Yeah, at least, yeah. At least. Yeah. And, and I've always I've always appreciated and and uh, impressed by his work. And I think that's what drew me to a friendship with Steve was the not only the quality, but the subject matter of his work. Every artist has a different way of express themselves but but to be honest i don't know where where we first met or how yeah no you? i can't think of it yeah yeah <laughs> yeah did you used to do there were those austin shows i don't think you did those austin texas shows the it, flat stocks no they were they, they were pre-flat it could have been there but but I don't know, I, Chicago I and Detroit are yeah. pretty much in close proximity. I mean, we were five hours away from each other. Mm -hmm. So right. I've gone to shows in Chicago, but um, yeah, I just was familiar with Steve's work and, and we met and just became friends. So, yeah. I was actually very curious. So in America, there's this phenomena of these rock poster festivals and these shows. So, what do events like that actually look like? And does it bring they're you know mostly artists together or is it more for people that are interested in the art form how does that usually work oh steve you want to do this oh. one i mean it's some of each i mean it all came together through the website gigposters.com r.i.p and uh i mean yeah i mean it started out small in san francisco it was the first one in a small space and a bunch of people got together flat stop they were called flat stop right yeah. Right. Right. But prior prior to that, there were record shows which the poster artists were going to the record shows and setting up, and that's where I started. This was prior to Flatstock. There was one in San Francisco that was big, and a lot of times they'd invite you to have you there rather than just vinyl records. They wanted poster artists there, so um, yeah, that's kind of where I started doing them. There was one in Philadelphia, one in uh, uh, Austin, Texas, was a big one. Um, and then the flag stops kind of evolved out of there. More post artists started coming out, and, and they're very cool. The biggest one, and where I was glad that because my feeling is that the 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 and, and again, I don't mean this in a, a negative manner, but but the West Coast poster artists are kind of they seem to kind of not pay as much regard to the East Coast artists, which I I consider Steve an East side of the country. As opposed to the west side yeah. so so they have a huge one out in san francisco called trips and it started out as the rock poster expo so i think in 90 92 was the first one 1992 and then it kind of grew into this trips festival and it's just poster artists and it's just the artists not the and oh and there's some dealers that show up but i was really happy to see steve out there one year because i would go do it every year since 92. Yeah. um and that's probably the biggest show that there's lines of people to get in this thing and old school artists, the new school artists. Um, and it's, a, it's a great show. So. 
Oh, thank you so much for yeah, sharing. It's, it seems like a big community gathering event. Uh, how long do these shows usually go on? Is it a day or a couple of days? The trips, I think, was two days, right? I don't know the flat stack. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Flat stack is usually a, a couple of days. It's usually attached to a festival. Like in Chicago, it's Pitchfork, so that's a three-day mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think they do a weekend at South by Southwest. Maybe a long weekend. Maybe it might be three days there. Mm -hmm. um, Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, we started, we just dived right into kind of what grown-up poster artists do, travel the country, go go to all of these great festivals. <laughs> but I'd love to, you know, bring it back to the very beginning because you both are two individuals that have had these really long and really great careers, I would say, as independent artists, but I'm sure that your paths were very different. So, Steve, why don't you share first, you know, how did you actually get into this line of work? Yeah. Uh... By accident, um, it was. I had a lot of friends in bands. I, I mean, music had always been important to me. Um, I kind of have art in my blood in my family. Uh, my grandfather was a commercial artist, and there are painters and musicians in my family. But I never really considered myself one. But I got laid off in 1990 from a job managing a liquor store, and just started making flyers for friends in bands while I was unemployed, and it. It just kind of took off from there. Um, I was kind of in the right place at the right time in the early 90s in Chicago. Um, the, it's when major labels were kind of looking for the next Seattle or whatever. Um, so bands were trying to get noticed. So they were making posters with some color on it. In Chicago before that, it was all just Xerox flyers and stuff. So anything with color kind of got people out to shows. And just kind of took off from there. So you were never kind of classically trained. You never went to any. No, kind not of at all. School. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no. I just kind of yeah. Taught, I bought myself a speedball kit at the art store and just started messing with it. Huh. And Mark, for you, as far as I know, uh, you did you did get some art. I mean, you studied art. How 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 did you how did your path bring you to rock concert posters? Well, I mean, real similar to Steve. I mean, it, it's pretty. And I think a lot of the poster artists, that's kind of it starts out as a love, and it, hopefully, it remains a love of doing it. And, and it's it's not for money. It's not for prop. It's just kind of something you like to do. It and the music ties into the art. But I did when I was in art school. Um, being in Detroit, everything was automotive related, and which I didn't want to do. I didn't want to get out of art school, and I really I didn't take fine art classes. I, I although I did in community college, but in art school I took <clears throat> graphic arts classes because I realized I'm going to get out of school and I'm going to have to get a job. Um, uh, but I ended up walking walking out of school one day. I got really frustrated. I think I was 12 credit hours sh short of graduating and just walked out. And I've just been hustling ever since then. But like like Steve, I always thought it was timing. Uh, the same thing. It just when when the people started recognizing the need for posters and artwork, and I just happened to be there like Steve at the right time and doing this stuff, and uh, it just it just caught on. So. Then it became a 20 year, 20, 25 year kind of sidetrack from what I had been doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm, I'm kind of curious. So for, from what I understand, you know, you're in two different cities, two different art scenes, but you kind of got into the rock concert poster genre specifically because it was a, you, you were embedded into the community and it was a community need and you enjoyed collaborating with other people. Is this the right perception or was there something more to it? Mark, for example. That, that, oh. that, that sounds Steve. about right to me. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah I wasn't, I mean, that, there was never a goal that this was gonna be my career and I'd be doing this 30 years later. It was just something I enjoyed doing and you know, maybe I could turn this into something else, you know, develop my talents. And, <laughs> but you never did, really. But, <laughs> but I never did. No. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. That, yeah, that, I, started, that's I, was, like, I was also, I was, go ahead. 
Well, just, just the, the collaboration part has always been a, an, an issue for me. I mean, it, it's nice collaborating with the bands and kind of, I always made sure that the, the art that I was doing related to the fans and the band. Where I started having problems was when the, the managements and the merchandisers okay. started getting involved in the artwork and wanting you to, to translate their ideas into yeah. to something else. You're right. That, that's really, there were, I mean, I can pretty much name the poster that I kind of thought, I'm not going to do this anymore. It's just, it's, it's lost. <laughs> the form. It's just kind of, you know, I can't please, I can't please myself. I can't please them because you're trying to read their minds. And it just, it just kind of, you know, what was once a lot of fun for a lot of years and a real good creative outlet for me turned into kind of a, a real difficult job. And, and I've always had problems with jobs. I think that's why I've, I've worked so long for myself um, because I don't like doing the same thing day by day and following somebody else's orders. I, I don't know if any of that makes sense, but I, I know Steve understands it. It just it does to me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think any any poster artist, a graphic artist, realizes once you once you know you get three or four people, or even up to twelve people, throwing ideas at you, and then making you change things. And and well, we were thinking this, or can you make the eyes look this way instead of this way? You know, it it just kind of right. Yeah, yeah. It, it there's, loses all, there's also a lot of. I don't know what I want, but show me some stuff and I'll tell you that I don't like it. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of that. So, yeah, what, you're, yeah. hey. what you're describing is actually something that I've heard a lot from modern creative professionals, especially from creatives that try to make a living out of and go into advertising or, you know, designers, anything that is kind of visual or creative that has a client, that it's very difficult to to even present a vision based on their needs when they're constantly getting output. So I feel like this is, this, I think probably Leonardo da Vinci had this issue. Like all artists through time had this issue <laughs> of the client butting in. But my next question is, so how would you usually just choose who to work with? Like, were there any projects that you said, oh God, I'm not going to do it? Or did you ever get to, when was the point in your career when you, would you, I mean, not in your, maybe in your creative path, when you started being very choosy on who you work with? Steve? Hmm. I, I, well, I've I never been real choosy. It, it just, <laughs> as long as they're, you know, if they tell me they're hiring me because they like my art and like my ideas, then let me yeah, go with yeah. it. Um, when I started being, I think the, the, the more you get known for what you're doing and the bigger bands and the more people you're doing, with, the, that's when it starts getting, it's getting, you know, where, where, and that's when I started slowing down. Every, there were probably like maybe five before I finally pretty much stopped. I mean, I, I do friends. I, the only thing I, things I do now are for locally for friends and people that I know I have good relationships with and that appreciate my stuff. Other than that, I just, you know, I there and I won't mention the name of the band, but they're going out on tour, but they recently wanted some artwork done. And so Steve, just like you said, they said, well, let's see what kind of ideas you got for this. Show us some ideas. And I said to them, I said, you know, let's not put the cart before the horse. Let's, let's talk about whether you're going to do silk screens or merchandise or what you need them for. And let's talk about my budget. As soon as I said my budget and mentioned money to them, it was like, okay, we don't need, we we're really not going to do this. And I don't mind if someone's going to pay me a lot of money, not that I'm greedy, but, but to do all those changes and, and, and rechanges and let's see this and that, that takes a lot of time. And uh, you know, if they're going to pay me for it, that's fine. But for the most part, and Steve, you can attest to this. We don't make a lot of money doing posters for bands. No, yeah. <laughs> they don't have a lot of money. I think I think that's true across the design industry. Like she was saying earlier, she's heard this from all facets of designers. I mean, you know, with with websites like Fiverr and you know people working so cheap now, people don't think about what they want if they if they're not paying for it. You know, if they know an agency is going to charge them ten thousand dollars to design something, they're going to be really specific yep. about what they want. 
Yep. But if you're not charging enough, then the, you know this, you're saying my work is worthless, and and they treat you that way. Mm -hmm. A problem that uh, creatives all over the world face. I'm uh, curious mm -hmm. to talk a little bit more in depth about the silkscreen process itself because it is a very analog, hands-on. You know, it's it's not on the computer. You mm -hmm. can't send a file. You can't send send a JPEG. Actually, Mark, I know that you have some. You have an example of of a work in progress uh, with you. Could you please like sh yes. show it to us and maybe explain to people who might not be familiar what is silk screen print and how it comes together? This was a, 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 a uh, authorized merchandise piece for Jimi Hendrix, a Jimi Hendrix show that there was never a poster for. And this is, this is the finished silk screen. It's just a copy that I copied. So most people, when they see this, think that's what the original artwork looks like. But with silkscreen, it's, it's, it's very different. You have to make a, a piece of art for every color that, that all has to lock together and fit together so that when you print it, so this is the black line art for that piece. And that's the first thing I do. And I think Steve pretty much approaches his art the same way. So yeah. you do the black line, and that's what that is. Then you have to do an overlay, and people do them different ways. You can do, you can ink them. This I happen to use this thing called Rubilith. I use these halftone patterns. So that this actually translates into one of the colors on this. So because that's a five color, I had to do five of these things that all fit together. This is uh, this is another color. I don't know if you can see with the reflections. Yeah. So it's very now they've made they've made computer programs that do this. I don't like computers because they there's a humanality to doing it this way. Sometimes everything's not exactly straight. It is a little bit off, and it just has that human touch to it. Where with the programs, and I think they call them rip programs that'll do silk screen separations. They're just too perfect. So, <laughs> so this is this is all done by hand. It's 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 time consuming, um, but it's something I enjoy doing. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm not doing it anymore. I kind of miss it. But uh, um, that's that's an original piece of art for a silk screen. Thank you so much for sharing. And Steve, uh, do you um, approach it in much the same way or are your steps different? Very much the same way. Yeah. Yeah. I still use Ruby Lith or, you know, draw on the films or whatever it takes to, it's, it's a matter of what blocking light when you're burning the screen. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. No, I never really learned how to I can actually computer. see in the background there, you got some of your line art up there. Uh, I don't know. That's a friend of mine up top oh. there. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I print her stuff too. But that's your poster in the middle there, right? On the, for, uh, yeah. The, the G Man, the, yeah, the Joe Pug, and yeah. Those are yours. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Steve, and actually, you've kind of segued into education, and you um, have a have a whole, I don't know, what do you call it, an organization which is called Screwball Academy. Yeah. So, how did that start out? And, and how do people. Um, that started out with. When I had kids, I moved my my operation into my my basement at my house, and uh, I, you know I was I was watching the kids all day, so I couldn't take on as much work as I wanted as I used to, and I had friends that that I had printed for that you know, I I just didn't have time for anymore, so I I told them to come over and I'd show them how to print, and it just kind of grew from there, um, and eventually I got a bigger space and started doing classes, and. Uh, Kind of using my shop as a co-op they take the class and learn the process learn how i do the process and then they could come in whenever they wanted and use the facilities um i haven't had the space for that for a couple of years now but but i'd like to get it going again at least on a smaller level but uh it was is it was, it was very rewarding like it, it it kept me excited about the process um, mm -hmm. just seeing, you know, I guess, yeah, you know, when you put that last color down and everything comes together, it, it's exciting. That, and, you know, just, and you know, 
That's one thing I noticed too. Is you can lay all uh, when you put one color next to another one, it'll change that first color, and then you put the right. next one down, yeah. and it'll change those two colors. They actually get a different hue to them because you know your eyes seeing the same. And then as soon as you put the black down, and yeah. that's what I liked about your stuff, Steve, is you use that heavy black for the last. Usually, all your stuff is trapped in a, a heavy black, and you use a yeah, lot of yeah. found imagery, which is really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, and then there's so much, there's so many variables involved in silk screen. I mean, the, the weather, the humidity, the yeah. temperature, <laughs> all these things will affect the inks, uh, drying, you know, it, it just, it's not, yeah. it's not a, a real mechanical, which you, what you might think of real mechanical process. There's a lot involved. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Steve, I've read that, uh, you know, for for your workshop, so on one hand, it's kind of an educational, but on the other, so people kind of use it as a co-working or they, the artists, they stick around and you, I've, it feels like you have a, like a little collective going on there. Um, I, yeah, I, I did. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not really happening. I mean, a lot of people went on to, you know, open their own shops, uh, Jay Ryan and Bird Machine and uh, Delicious Design League in town, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of other people that you know are, don't necessarily have shops, but they they still work in the medium. Um, so yeah, I mean yeah, and it's, it's it's the different ways people have taken it. I had one woman that was making shoes, and she was printing on the soles of the shoes. Like they, they were all made out of wood. And now she's in Rockford with this giant shoe factory. Um, my friend John Sampson now works at Mad Magazine. He's basically the Al Jaffe guy there, doing the 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 back fold in cover thing and and lots of strips and stuff like that. So it's yeah, it's it's been really fun to see how people take their talents. Mm -hmm. And I've also read that you you actually opened a shop. So when COVID started, or was it a little bit before you opened a shop called Burgoo, where you sell, uh, where you present the works of local artists, uh, not only printmakers. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, well, like you say, yeah, when COVID hit, yeah, most of my work was uh, show posters. So that wasn't happening anymore. Um, so we decided to open a store and I, you know, I know a lot of people that make stuff. Um, and there's a lot of people we found in the neighborhood, um, that make, you know, stuff besides printed matter, <coughs> excuse me. And, uh, I mean, we have that, we opened that in about a year ago, uh, November. So right before Christmas, which was a good time to open a store and did pretty well with it for a few months and, and, you know, we weren't sure if we were going to keep it going after post COVID, but, but it's, it seems to be popular in the neighborhood. So yeah, we're mm -hmm. just keeping that going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It feels like local artists and in general rock concert posters, they've, you know, from the very beginning, they've become such collectible items and appreciated by people even beyond the I don't know, the the rock scene for their aesthetics for their look but also for their utility so I think that's a that it's so how do you actually feel about people you know who might not be connected with the world collecting your artwork is that something you think about I mean, I, I don't I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just so busy in my own little world yeah I I mean. Um, I I find it and, and I find it interesting and, and then when when uh, it shows up in different I mean for, for example this this show in Kiev I never imagined I'd be having a show of my art in Kiev um, and it's all it's all you know it, it's it's interest it's connections it's whatever but my niece I have a niece who. Uh, kind of travels around and, and she's in the horse business and she walked into a little pub in Ireland and she said they had one of my posters on the wall in there. And so she told the guy, you know, that, that's my uncle and blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I think to me, that's amusing. It just, you know, how to get yeah. over in Ireland. So, mm -hmm. um, 
It's just, I, I think, uh, I think music is loved by everybody everywhere. And then when you throw art in the mix, uh, you've got a nice, uh, you know, joining of two different art forms. And uh, I think everybody relates to that. Yeah. We have a comment from Jessica. Thanks for bringing a slice of Michigan to Kiev. My relatives are all from the Detroit and Toledo areas, and my parents were a part of the rock scene there in the 1970s. They passed down their love of music to me, and I had the great opportunity to then go to many of the same venues while in grad school. The Blind Pig was a mainstay in the 90s and beyond. I wonder about the physical spaces of rock today. I feel like the rock scene and scenes are always evolving, surviving the worst, and even will survive COVID. I know this ethic shares something with the tenacity and resilience of Detroit. Um, so, I, Mark, as a representative of the, the, the Detroit rock scene, so the Blind Pig. I'm very familiar with it. <laughs> I've, I've been to shows there. It's in Ann Arbor, Michigan, actually, which is a, a little drive, and it's, it's a college, a university town. Not a college, but a university town, and and they had some great clubs, and they had a lot of a lot. There was a lot of punk music that was played at the Blind Pig. A lot of Detroit bands would go to the Blind Pig, um, but as far as the tenacity and resent, I mean Detroit, I I think it's it's kind of people don't realize how much good music has come out of Detroit over the years, and different different genres of of music. I mean anything from blues to jazz. There were so many good clubs and there still are. And one of the things during COVID that kind of, um, I started noticing a lot of the, I mean, musicians like artists, artists have to make art, musicians have to play. So a lot of them were doing online, uh, uh, like Facebook live kind of gigs and, and, um, you know, putting out a tip jar on there and you could donate, but you could listen. And, and that kind of prompted me to start selling my art online. We do a, a a show every and you asked me about that Lucy but yeah it's just you know it, if if you've got that kind of drive in you and that creativity you've got to do something with it so as bad as COVID is it's, it's not it's not going to stop the music coming out of Detroit there's there's still a lot of great bands and a lot of people that, that and same thing with Chicago I mean there's a lot of, uh, Chicago's got a huge history of, of good music mm -hmm. so yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's so interesting to discuss the role of rock in kind of today's culture. It was such, the, the genre itself was such an incredible, uh, you know, pop culture phenomena for decades. You know, we have from, from Jimi Hendrix, you've also, Mark, you've also um, made works from, made works for you know, very famous Michigan Iggy Pop. We have a work uh, right right behind me, one of your works for Patti Smith, who's been also in the area. And kind of in the recent years, it seems like in the recent decades that maybe maybe even rap has taken on the protest and counterculture role that rock seemed to occupy. Is this something that any, that any of you actually think about, the role of rock today? and the rock scene. Steve? Any thoughts? <laughs> um, uh, well, yeah, I think about it. I, I, I'm, I'm an old man, so I, you know, there, there's some rap I like, but I, I haven't really been able to follow it with the vigor I used to be able to follow the indie rock scene or, you know, you know I don't have expendable income to go out and buy records and go to shows every night like I used to. Um, but, but yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mark. Well, I, I think music has always been a, an expression of, uh, uh, you know, political feelings, uh, what's going on in the world. People have always expressed it through music. I mean, mo if you look at most bands, and not only bands, like any, any kind of, uh, um, you know, they're going to write songs about, you know, kind of what's going on in the world, the good, the bad, you know, and, and it's it's a way of expressing your your feelings. So mm -hmm. I, I personally, I, I'm the same way as Steve. I'm, I, I don't follow rap. It's, I, I appreciate it. Um, you know, it's a form of expression, but it's just something I don't 
just like jazz, I never, I never understood jazz, you know. So I, I don't listen to it. So. Yeah, but you've still created beautiful artworks for for all of the touring musicians in the area. I've seen the, the ones that you've done for blues in particular. They they're really striking, Mark. Well, thank you. I, I remember the the uh, you know I, I I don't know how Steve if I know how I would work. The promoters would contact me. The venues, whoever had the the rights to do what I did, would contact me. I never contacted anybody. But a promoter from the uh, West Coast called me once. And he said, "We know you're not going to want to do this, but we're interested in having a Tom Jones po poster done." And, and I said, <laughs> "Hell yes, I'd love to do that." This is, you know, yeah. Tom Jones. He's not he's not rock and roll, but he's an icon. So maybe not so much yeah. anymore, but. So I did this Tom Jones but, uh, poster with this these kind of cute bunny girls on the side. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we actually have this poster on view in our exhibition, so I highly recommend coming and Oh, the Tom that. Jones one? Yeah, we have the Tom Jones oh, one. Oh, cool. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we have another comment. We actually have a question from Jessica. Uh, please share the links where we can follow and support your art. I believe that Mark on your website, um, we'll, we'll, we'll share the link to your website in okay. our chat so that people can learn a little bit more. And you also do um, on your Facebook page, correct? Correct, your correct. I'm, I'm, I'm almost using my Facebook page more. I mean, my website's kind of current, but... Um, I had somebody that was taking care of all that for me, which I don't anymore. So it's kind of like, mm -hmm. if you're going to buy something on my website, buy it now because I haven't raised my prices in, in <laughs> I don't know, years. And, and I don't charge for shipping inside the United States. I charge for overseas shipping, but uh, uh, that's something I got to correct. But but on my Facebook page, I'm using that as kind of a, more of a business Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And I put a lot of the painting. I'm, I'm painting a lot now and doing a lot of pencil drawings and, and I post a lot of that stuff on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, so, it's so interesting, interesting to see how some, how, some, uh, how many, how many artists, artists have embraced, have embraced uh, uh, these new uh, these new arenas for, uh, for 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 commerce and just for growing their uh, kind of their reach and just th this new wave of entrepreneurship has been really interesting to see. Uh, and we have another comment from Kirill, bright, warm colors and, sorry, uh, bright, warm colors and ideas in art give something magical to people waiting for your murals on buildings in Kiev. So actually, Mark does, he, he has done murals in the past. Uh, I, Mark, would you be able, would you be open to doing another one? <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to come to Kiev. I, I, I mean, that's you, you know, you had asked uh, in some of the questions about things we do outside of art, and and I think it was usually art related. But I love to travel. I love to go to to new places, different cultures. Um, so yeah, if, uh, I'd love to come to Kiev. I, as a matter of fact, I think I've got somebody I could stay with over there. <laughs> I believe you, do. John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Steve, how about you? Uh, what are other some areas? Have you ever done a mural or be in interested in doing one? I would be interested in learning the process. Of it. I, I feel like I, I don't really know anything about how to go about doing that. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I have friends that have done them, Jay Ryan and, and quite a few others, but yeah, I need to research that and, and <laughs> see what goes into how it's done. I mean, yeah. 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 It's always interesting to see how artists um, embrace new ideas in new arenas. Uh, see, while, we're, while, yeah. while we have you on our screen, um, what is something about the Chicago arts and music scene, do you feel, that is very specific to the area? Um. How would you describe it? I, f I feel like there's like a, a sense of competition here that works in a good way, uh, more so than in other cities I've I've been in. It's not uh, mean. It's it's it just makes everyone do the best they can without trying to cut someone else down. Mm. Um, so it kind of raises, you know, everyone try, tries to raise the bar. And, uh, you know, 
I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting to hear. And what about the, the rock spaces? Any favorite venues that you have? Um, well, I mean, the, the people in the beginning, it doesn't exist anymore, but there was one called Lounge Axe that were the, the folks that really encouraged me in the beginning. You know, if they, if they hadn't given me any, the, any encouragement, I wouldn't have lasted two years. <laughs> but uh, currently there's the Metro. Uh, there's a place called The Hideout, which is you know just a tiny little bar, but they get really good bands in. And uh, the nicest people, it's like family. It's, you know, those, kind of, those kinds of places I really like. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm too old for big venues where you're getting crushed and <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that anymore. Yeah. What has been your favorite thing about being in your line of work? Um, I guess, I mean, you know, at the freedom, I mean, we're, you know, going back to designing these things. I mean, um, there's more freedom doing this than I think in any other line of design work. Um, there, there, you know, there was for a while, I, you know, I, you know it can be, I guess, um, uh, which is also the frustrating part too, because it's like when things are slow, it's, it's also, you know, your fault. So it's, it's... <laughs> Mark, what about you? Any well, favorite thing? Well, Steve had mentioned, um, the, the competition that in Chicago, there's no, you know, competition between the artists and, and the whole art scene. But and the, one of the things that I, I noticed personally and the, that I really like about the poster artists and doing these shows, everyone is so supportive of each other. And, and there's yeah. no competition yeah. whatsoever that, that I've ever noticed. In, in the whole poster field. Everyone accepts what the other person's doing. And it's like a big family. Um, and that's what that's what I miss because they've shut the shows down for, during COVID. And, uh, you know, I miss going to those. And, and, and you know, everybody's friends and, and supportive of everybody. So um, I, I, I really miss those shows. They were, especially the one in San Francisco. <laughs> I hope that you get the chance to, you know, to get back to them really soon. But what you were saying about how everyone is so supportive and, and Steve, particularly for you, you teach so many new people, I mean, people new to the, to the technique. Um, is creativity something that you believe to be innate, something people are born with, or is this something that can be taught actually and developed? I think, I think it can be taught and developed. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I don't, maybe, maybe you need to, I mean, you have to want to create things. That's, that's the first thing. I don't know if that can be taught, but I mean, it's, you know, the more you do it, the more you, the more creative you get, I think. I mean, that's been my experience for me personally. Um, you know, my, my process is I, I just start working with my hands and then, the ideas start coming. Um, I know other artists who have the the genius idea and execute it, and mm -hmm. and but you know there's a, there's so many different ways that inspiration hits people. That I mean, mm -hmm. so you, you're it, more. It has to be encouraged. I don't know about taught, but at least encouraged and nurtured. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're more process based. So you don't approach, you kind of you, you develop the idea as you go along, correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, how about you? Do you start out an artwork with a specific vision or it just comes together as you work along it? Kind of both ways. It depends what I'm, what I'm doing, but, uh, you know, I was really, I, I had a, my, my father always wanted me to go into business. My mom was very supportive of what I did. Um, so that was real helpful to me. And, uh, um, but I, I think you're, I, I tend to look at everything as, as some sort of creative process. Even the, even the guy that's laying the cement walk down, you know, uh, laying cement down, that's a creative process. And, you know, some people will take more time with it and put more into it than others. 
And so I, I think everybody has that. It's just a matter of developing it. But I think what's important, when I was in high school, is I had a couple of art teachers that wanted you to create art that they do. They want to teach you only the things that they know and that they're and, and to me it's always been important, like Steve Steve taught silkscreen. Okay, teach them how to use the tools that they have um, and and then let them run with it. So so for me it's always been Yeah, I never I never yeah, I never forced you know I never yeah, talked about design. Except yeah, you, you have you have to do it this apply to the medium. Yeah, I mean the medium has limitations, so you have to work within those limitations, but yeah, I just tried to help them. Yeah, yeah, make their what they do work for silkscreen, right? So even like you said, you you don't know that much about paint murals. There is a technique to that. I I I kind of learned from a guy that did it commercially for a designer, and then once I picked up all those little tips and how to do this and how you transfer this up and, and what you do. Um, you know, then then you start adding your own to it and and changing things and right. developing it, and and that's 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 what I think is way more important. How do how do you use the tools available to you? Um, right. Mm -hmm. From what you describe, it seems that um, mentorship and working on, alongside other artists has been something that has really supported your artistic practice and the way it developed through the years. Yeah. Who, me or Steve or both of us? I mean, I mean, I feel like for both of you, but if I'm wrong, I mean, feel free to comment. I mean, for you, definitely, Mark. Steve, how about you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, yeah. Um, when, when we were silk, when I started silk, well, I had silk screened out of my garage. The first thing was a t shirt. And then I uh, hooked up with this uh, company, Ghetto Press, which was just uh, uh, friends people that I got to know with mutual interests that were screen printing t-shirts. Um, and so we started doing flat stuff. And to me, <laughs> as messed up a place as it was uh, because of the personalities involved, it was probably one of the most creative atmospheres I've ever been into. We would have bands stop by, you know, we, we, we tell them, you know, we're, we're printing a poster today. They come by, we buy a bunch of beer or whatever we needed to get us through the evening and just, you know, start printing it. And a couple of times, you know, I'd say, well, let's put this color down. Somebody would yell, no, let's try this color, you know. And, and so it was kind of like spontaneous. Um, but to this day, like I said, as, as this – dysfunctionally functional as the place was it was probably one of the most creative collaboration things i've been involved in and i think because it was just it was musicians it was artists just coming by and uh i mean this was in the early days and everybody was just on kid rock would come by um you know some rap guys i don't even know would just stop by uh everybody was just coming by there a uh, grimshaw Grimshaw would show up to Carl Lundgren, who's another Detroit poster artist from old school, um, would would rent a little corner of our space every summer because he lived in Florida and he wanted to be in Detroit to do shows. Um, so the whole place was just a, a hotbed of creativity and it was it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. Steve, did you have like similar uh, things like that in Chicago? Oh, absolutely, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, yeah, especially yeah, with the, running, running the co-op co and stuff, it was, you know, just being around other people and seeing how they work and kind of feeding off each other, I mean, really helped me. I mean, you know, I mean, hey, I'm, Jay Ryan worked for me for a while, and he was su such a good illustrator, typographer, still is, um, that, you know, it, I, I hadn't, hadn't really thought of a lot of issues that I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have thought of a lot of these things. And anyway, if I hadn't been working next to people that were better than me, and it, well, you yeah. know, he, I don't think yeah. he's been, his art is different than yours. Yeah, I, I, well, I, yeah, I would yeah. use the word better because you, you well, he probably, he, he probably, well I, he I don't want to interrupt you, but he probably learned a lot off of you too, <laughs> from you, from oh, being sure. next yeah. to you. So yeah. I think he would say so too. Yeah, I think he has said so. But, but yeah, no, it's yeah, you know, it's a mutual thing, right? Mm -hmm. 
So we've talked right. about something that's really supported your creative practice through the years. And what is something that has hindered it? What do you think got in the way? <laughs> COVID. Um, uh, life. For me, uh, life. life my, my own inability to be a business guy. Mm. Um, <laughs> so, so many things. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wish I would have. Yeah, there are a lot of times I wish I would have studied art in school instead of having to learn it all the hard way and the slow way. But it is what it is. You, and, and I don't I don't want to mention names and, and, and probably Steve, you probably know the, the people I'm talking about that that are, are real successful at poster art and are, are making a lot of money. Yet they get stuck into the same. They don't go out of that realm, and, and I understand why they're making money. Or why should they right. change this? And why but, would they? Right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But but they don't they don't grow. They don't grow or explore or, or go in any other direction. Whereas I I mean, if, if I, rumor one of the bars that I used to frequent that with a lot of other people was that I had tons of money and I was just rolling in dough because people knew who I was and what I was doing. Um, right. So I, I told yeah. the people over there, I said, yeah, hey, just kind of further that along, tell my own five cars and whatever. But I, if, <laughs> if I was one of these other guys, if, if money, and I'm like, see, I'm not a businessman. I don't, I, I, not that I squander money, but I just, you know, I would work for free just to do the work, just to get something out. Um, and I don't charge, to, still to this day, like I told you on my website, I haven't raised prices in probably five to seven years on stuff. Um, and I'm not a businessman, I'm an artist. So so that's, that's kind of, like Steve, that's kind of what's hindered me, but it hasn't really hindered. I really don't care about that stuff. I mean, I, I'm able to feed myself, I'm able to pay my bills, um, so I, as far as me, I don't know what's, that's a tough point, what's hindered. I don't feel like anything's really hindered me. From, I can always, I know when I moved out of, out of my studio, I used to paint real, real big, big paintings. I, I, and I like doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I moved because of, of the, the direction the, the, the building was going in that I lived in, the, the people that owned the building. I'd had a major flood in my my space, and so I moved out of there. So when I moved into my house, I don't I don't have the room to paint big. So I picked up a pencil, an eraser, and a piece of paper and started drawing. And I thought, boy, this is nice. No fumes. All I need, you know, I've got an eraser. Uh, um, so that's that's mainly what I've been doing is painting smaller, but but doing a lot of pencil drawings. And so. So, you know, the fact that I don't have the space to paint large anymore hasn't really hindered me. It's just taken me in a new direction. Mm -hmm. no, it's so interesting to hear um, kind of your take on it, Mark, because I've, I've read a lot of interviews and we've, we've talked quite a lot in preparation for your exhibit. And the, uh, the line that always comes through is that, you know, your creativity has never been hindered because you've made kind of the conscious choice to put that in the focus and not kind of the business pursuits and not the um, kind of economic, although that is something that everyone has to keep in mind then again nowadays. And it's, it, you know, it's interesting to talk about that. Of course, there are, you know, everyone has to pay the bills and do things like that. Uh, but in terms of, you know, when we talk about independent music, it, it, it kind of started out as DIY bands and people that were self-releasing and, um, and it's turned into this big movement that is actually just as commercialized as, uh, as kind of the bigger names. You know, we have these indie rock bands that actually yeah. they have, they, 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 kind of have stadiums and they don't really self-release. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a different level. Have we seen something similar to that in the art world? Uh, Steve, I saw you nodding very, <laughs> very heavily to what I was saying. <laughs> I was just agreeing. Yeah. Um, there, Steve, there was a guy in Chicago, and they, there was a form of art that was popular for a while called uh, uh, outsider art. And, and they were guys, they were, they were artists that were just, 
supposedly some of them lived in the street and would just pick up yeah. stuff and draw. Then all of a sudden, all these outsider artists who have art backgrounds, who have training, are selling themselves as outsider artists. Um, yet in my eyes, that's not what outsider art is. It's it's a guy that, oh, that were... is is. Uh, I'm trying to think of the guy's name from Chicago. Wow, Wesley Willis. Yeah, Wesley Willis. He was schizophrenic. Yeah. He was. Um, yeah. Yet he had gallery shows. He was he was big. There was there was a guy that used to come by my yeah. studio named Paul. Uh, I can't remember his last name. And he lived in the cast quarter, which traditionally has been kind of like the the seedier part of Detroit. Now now it's not anymore. It's got bought up and built up, and you know. So, but but he lived Paul Harrison, and he would come by the studio and bring his current drawings that he did and give them to me. But he he'd always mm -hmm. you know he didn't take the bus. He didn't drive, um, and I have a big collection of his art. And he would want money for markers, and you know he goes, "I don't want anything, but I'm out of markers, so I, I'd give him money, you know, so he could buy markers." But those are the kind of people that are true outside art. And if you look, if you look at a big body of his stuff, you can see what this guy needed to do and what he was doing. Um, yeah. But yeah, that 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 is is kind of like a commercial, you know, people that were just doing art because they didn't. Didn't pay the bill. There's a place in Hamtramck that fortunately they got a grant to keep it. Hamtramck has been the Polish area just outside of Detroit where the Polish settled in. And uh, there was a guy that lived in there that that d turned his garage, his whole backyard, and the whole half of his house into what they call uh, the Hamtramck Disneyland or something. And it was all these whirly gigs that he had made. And he, he put all over his backyard, and it, people would come from all over. I think they've written articles on it. People would come over to visit this thing. And he did it for no other reason than to just do it. He didn't expect people to come by. He didn't expect articles to be there. Well, he passed away, and fortunately some people had the sense to, to get a grant and, and kind of keep it rather than tear it down. It's in a, it's in a residential neighborhood that's kind of – on the decline, decline a little bit, but younger people are moving in there. Um, so, so I, now see, I've forgotten the question. I got off on a tangent, but it had, to, it had, had to do with art forms or something. But, but that that's one of those things that are outside. Oh, you asked Steve about Chicago. Sorry for interrupting you, Steve, but it just kind of no, it's okay. No, no, that's been one of my pet little pieces. These these established artists get out there and that are doing outside art that really is an outsider art it the way i understand it mm -hmm. yeah uh, and then there's guys like howard finster who started out like that but then you know got some attention and saw some success before they died um you know a lot of these guys get discovered after they pass away and somebody else makes a lot of money off of them yeah yeah um mm -hmm. but i was lucky to be able to print for howard one time and we went down and like had him sign the stuff and got to stay in the house on paradise garden but that was you know, after he had a nicer house in town and stuff and but uh yeah you know it was good to see him actually enjoy some money you know from his success mm -hmm. but i yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't deny that he wasn't an outsider artist anymore Mm -hmm. after he started making money so it's yeah it's a yeah. fine line <laughs> is there really a way to be an independent artist today like have you ever thought about if you were young and just starting out now like what would your life be and what would you focus on <laughs> i have never thought of that <laughs> um, I, I mean it <laughs> seems like it seems like in some ways it's easier now to be independent. Yeah, you, you you have all these tools to sell your own stuff. You don't have to go begging the galleries and museums and all the. I mean, you can, you know, if you know, it's a matter of catching on and I guess promoting yourself, which I'm terrible at. And uh, you know, it, it seems in theory like it, it's easier now than ever to me. Mark, what do you think? Well, when I when I was in high school. I was kind of a rebellious experimental kid and, and uh, 
like I said, my mom was very supportive of me, but she was also not very, she wasn't judgmental at all, but she was worried about me. What, what was going to happen to me? Well, you know, um, when I got out of high school and whatever. So we, we had a neighbor that owned a pretty successful engineering company, and he gave me a job as a detailed draftsman because my math skills, I mean, I always got good grades in school. My math skills were good, and I liked drawing. So he said, come on, be a detailed draftsman. I'm thinking, I'm going to make some money doing this. And I did it for a while, and I learned the, the whole thing. I was still in high school. And he, he decided that, well, he called me in his office one day and said, you know, you're so good at this. And, and he thought I needed some direction, too. And he said, I'm going to send you to an apprentice school. And he pretty much at that point laid my whole future out for me. And the way I interpreted it, you know, he told me how much money I'm going to be making, what I'm going to do. I could come and work for him and blah, 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 blah. And I interpreted it as, yeah, I'm going to have uh, two and a half kids in a one-car garage and a lawn, lawn to mow every, you know, every week. And I'll never do art again because I was still drawing a lot and, and painting at the time. You know, even from a kid, I was doing that kind of stuff. Um, and and so for two weeks, yeah, I lost sleep over this. Do I, you know? And, and I went in his office and I said, you know what? He, I call him Hugh, even though it was, you know he was my superior, he was a neighbor. I said, I, I can't do this. I'm going to quit. And he tried to talk me out of it, but I said, I just couldn't see myself doing the same thing day after day, going into the same job week after week, and and having a house. And these were kind of – maybe it was the responsibility. Maybe that's what it was because I still think I don't – you know, I know what I need to be responsible to, and I know what I don't. So, so, um, so I quit, and – Ever since then, I've hustled. It's always been working for printers, doing illustrations, for drawings. It just kind of um, just anywhere I could get a little bit of work until I figured out how to, you know, do it. For, but but I, I pretty much seem to always have been doing something. Um, and if it wasn't art related, it was just strict. I delivered papers one winter. What a hellacious job that was. It was just kind of worked in a, in a huge uh, apartment complex where I'd have to, you know, deliver these papers. And, uh, um, mm -hmm. you know, but I did what I needed to do. So. Mm -hmm. This is a conversation that I've heard come up many times, even with, with musicians, that actually the part-time job is uh, is something so ubiquitous and so normal for creatives all over like like Steve uh, you you know additionally to being a, a print artist you you have burgoo you have the education you know there's there's so much more that you do outside of it and Mark you have so many different uh, alleyways on that it's so interesting that we still that this is so normal but it's still kind of the day job mentality is uh, maybe looked upon in certain, I mean, looked down upon in certain art circles uh, as if it's the idea to make it is that you're an artist full time. But um, is it that way in, in your local art scenes? I don't, I don't look down on anybody that has a regular job. It's just personally, I couldn't do that. But um, yeah, I don't know. Most a lot of the artists I know in Detroit have some some sort of other income. If if they you know if not a full time job and they're doing art, and I personally I, I guess I tend to be a little uh, what's the word I'm looking for spoiled about it. Where you know if you got a full time job and you're making a lot of money and you're doing one painting every or one piece of art every six months and you call yourself an artist. I just, I, I, I'm a little spoiled about that. I, not that I think you have to sacrifice to be an artist. And I'll tell you, to be honest with you, for a long time, up until maybe 20 years ago, even though I was making my living and paying my bills through, through the arts, I had a hard time calling myself an artist. People would ask me, well, what do you do for a living? And I would always say, I make art. I never said I'm an artist because because I think okay. I had that idea that you had to be sacrificing something. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't know what point it was I started calling myself an artist. I still very rarely say I'm an artist, but uh, 
I, and I don't feel I've sacrificed anything. So I don't know. I don't know. Steve? Yeah, I mean, I've always considered myself more of an artisan than an artist. I mean, I've, you know, especially not having gone to school for it or any of that stuff, I, I felt like I was lying by calling myself an artist. Um, uh, maybe designer sometimes, but more artisan. I make stuff. I like that's that, that's what I love about doing this is like, you know, having an idea in the morning. At the end of the day, I have this finished product that I made with my own two hands, and that's that's a pretty rare thing in this world anymore. Yeah, everything yeah. is so separate. Everyone's got their own little part of the job, and and it doesn't seem like anyone has that that you know sense of pride in what the final product and for very few people now there's now there's all these uh computer what do they call that like filters or something where you can take you can take your portrait put it in there and put these filters in there and create a piece of art and there's a lot of people doing that now um, yeah, i know yeah <laughs> and calling themselves artists i i just you know i i, I don't know I just oh well, they have programs that, that you can just like set up to like just start painting on the screen and walk away for two days and come back and see where it's at and you can stop it there if you think it's finished oh. or oh really it continues it going, kind of like redirect it a little I have a friend that does stuff like that I mean you know he's been a painter for years and it's you know it's just something he plays around with but but it's yeah I mean it's yeah. It's a different world than it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Steve and Mark, thank you so much. It's already been uh, over you. an hour and we can keep oh, talking wow. forever. Um, it's been such an honor to talk to two, you know, creators and makers in a very pure sense that use their hands and approach their art and all of their activities with such a sense of community and um, it's it, it's really great to talk to you and hear your experiences and and your your insights into what it's like being an, an independent artist. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it was it, it's fun. It's Steve, such thanks. a great pleasure to bring together Detroit and Chicago in our America House virtual space tonight and everyone i encourage you to uh to read more about steve and mark's works and to look them up online and i hopefully very soon you'll be able to visit america house kiev again to see mark's works live some of which i have behind me but i can tell you that seeing silk screen in the original is an incredible experience. It's just it just gives you so much appreciation for the absolutely intricate work that is done by all of these artists. And so, Steve and Mark, thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you so Steve, much. Thanks. It was good seeing you, man. Yeah, always a pleasure. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Take care. Bye.